I probably don't need to ask this, but have you ever lain awake at night, worried about how you were going to make ends meet? Maybe you received an unexpected bill, or just lost your job, or some other life event has happened and now you're feeling anxious. Maybe I should rephrase my question and ask, not if this has ever happened to you, but when was the last time? Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host, and if you identify with that middle-of-the-night anxiety, I'm here to tell you first that, well, you're not alone, and the next, that I have a solution to that worry. Yes, I do. Well, actually, it's not my solution. The answer is from Jesus' own words, and you'll hear his counsel in our study of Matthew chapter 6 today. As the Bible Bus continues our five-year journey through the whole Word of God, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, addresses today the age-old worry of not having enough. What's a Christian to do? We'll find out some very practical steps on how to sleep well in spite of financial need. Before we jump in, though, we got just a minute, so let's share a great letter. This is from a wise man from Springfield, Missouri. He's enjoying his eighth complete trip on the Bible bus. That means that he's been listening for almost 40 years. Leonard writes us, Well, I'm still here and still listening to Dr. McGee every evening at 930. November 2nd, my 97th birthday, is not far away, and I think I will make it. I'm enjoying Obadiah as never before. It still astounds me that I find new things each time I hear it. Since I am now living alone, I can concentrate fully on the studies. Dr. McGee was a wise man. When he talks about what is happening to us as a nation and a culture, he could be making observations on the present hour. How we need to pray for each other. Isn't that great? Just think of all that he's learned and the important things that we're going to learn today as we let the Lord love us and provide for us as he promises to. Here's another great letter. This is one from a brother on the Bible bus in southwest India listening to TTB in Canada. Since my childhood, I have listened to this program with my grandmother, and it became a habit. Though I worshipped false gods, I didn't stop listening to God's word. Once my family broke my radio as they didn't like me listening to Christian programs, I bought a new one and started listening to you again. Then I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior and have introduced the radio programs to many people. Now if I miss it, I listen on the mobile app. By the grace of God, I now lead groups in my home. Yep, that's just how God works. Now let's give this time to Him as we begin our study in Matthew chapter 6. Heavenly Father, teach us the truth that you've hidden within your word. Give us the spiritual eyes to see what you want to show us. Grow our faith, Lord, as it's a gift from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we return back today to the study and the Sermon on the Mount. We come to the seventh chapter. But I said last time that I'd have a further word to say relative to these material things that were mentioned last time, like money and material things, the relationship of a believer to those things. Now, a great many people think that money is something that ought never to be discussed in the church. We just should talk about spiritual things. Well, the Lord Jesus certainly had a great deal to say about it. Now, the Sermon on the Mount has a very definite interpretation as it relates to the coming kingdom. The king is putting down here his manifesto. Well, now, since the king is our Lord, he's our Savior, then what he says, we ought to listen to it. Now, it doesn't mean that you can make this your religion in the sense that you don't need a Savior and you can keep it. You could never measure up to it apart from his strength. Now, I suppose that as he's shown these externalities that they are important, but that unless they're done in the right way, they become meaningless. And we see the relationships of the citizen of the kingdom of heaven actually to God here. And it's revealed in these external acts of righteousness. We've seen it had to do with alms, giving of alms. Don't do it publicly. Don't do it for display. It's a relationship between you and God and expresses that relationship. And the same is true of prayer. Actually, the most effective prayer is when you enter into your closet. Pray privately. I'm not much for public prayer meetings, by the way, because of the fact the deadest service in any church today is a prayer meeting. You can't have anything deader than that. 
I used to try to build him up, and I've soon discovered that if you have 50 dead saints praying, you don't improve it by getting 100 dead saints. You still have a pretty dead prayer meeting. What we need is a great deal more private prayer of that type of thing, and it should be done between a person and God. Now we have also fasting is put on the same kind of basis. Fasting has a value. I'm convinced of that, but not publicly. It should be a private, personal matter between the soul and God. And then money is a real test of your relationship to God. You see, money can become your God. The almighty dollar is the God of many today. And covetousness is called idolatry, you recall, by Paul. Therefore, we're not to attempt to put treasure on earth, but you actually can put money in the Lord's work and by doing it, and if it is the Lord's work and is used for the propagation of the gospel to get the word of God out, then, my friend, it can be translated or transferred to heaven. It becomes legal tender in heaven, and that's where we gather treasures in heaven. And now he mentions this matter of the material things, our relationship to the material things. Listen to him again as I go over this. He says, Behold the fowls of the air, verse 26, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Now don't misunderstand. A great many people misunderstand. Actually, the birds of the air, they can't sow. They can't reap, and they can't gather into barns, but you and I can. But we are to do that with the same abandon that the little bird has. The little bird's trusting God to take care of him, and we ought to do that. That doesn't mean that we should not exercise judgment because he's given us that judgment. And a Christian asked me, he said, you think a Christian ought to have insurance? Sure ought to. <laughs> That's one of the means that you have today. And the important thing is that we are not to go through this life with these things becoming a burden to us. For instance, verse 28, And why take ye thought of raiment? Just think of the style shows. Think of today the dress of both men and women, the time that is consumed. I'm sure that all of you have had the experience of your wife saying, Now I can go, I don't have a dress. And maybe you've said, well, I certainly can't go to this affair. I just don't have the right kind of a suit or necktie to wear. Well, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Well, they can't toil or spin, and yet God takes care of them. You toil and you spin, but don't let it become the burden to you. Of course, a Christian ought to dress as stylishly as they possibly can and ought to dress nicely. I think to be sloven in dress and to be sloven in our actions is really not honoring to God. And our Lord said, just look at the flower. Look what God does for it. God, I think, wants us to use color and be beautiful, as pretty as we can. Some of us don't have much to work with to begin with, but we ought to do the best we can with what we've got and look the best. Because he said concerning these, consider the lilies. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now God's able to clothe the grass of the field. Today it is, tomorrow it's gone. He's able to take care of you. So this idea of being overly anxious about the things of the world, may I say this ought not to be our goal in life. We ought to put the, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then as he takes care of the flowers and the birds, he'd take care of you. But the thing to do is put him first. Take therefore no thought, no anxious thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the days the evil thereof. And someone has said that today is the tomorrow that we worried about yesterday. That's it. And how true that is for many of us. Now chapter 7 we come to the last chapter, and you have here the relationship of the child of the king with other children of the king, and it must be maintained by prayer. Then he gives some final warnings here. He says, judge not that ye be not judged. And believe me, 
that's one that has really been misunderstood. It doesn't mean a child of God is forbidden to judge others, but it means this, judge not that you be not judged. It means to decide, to distinguish, but it also means to condemn. It means to avenge, and it actually can mean to damn. It means here that we are not to judge the inward motives in the same sense of condemning, because you do not know why your brother did that. We can't understand it. We can only see the outward acts, and he doesn't forbid us judging wrong actions and evil actions as we're going to see. But the point is, judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Well, it means simply this. If you are harsh in your judgment of others, you will be known as that kind of a person who's harsh in his judgment of others. There are certain people. You know them. I know them. Somebody says, don't pay any attention to what he says or she says. They never have a good word. Well, you see, they're being judged by the way they judge. That's what he's saying here. And now he says, why beholdest thou the mote that's in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that's in thine own eye? And actually, what he's talking about here is a little piece of sawdust, and you judge that piece of sawdust in your brother's eye, and you got a whole log, a great big redwood log in your own eye. That is exactly what our Lord is saying here in this connection. Now, he says that you're in no position to do that. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. You're in no position to judge. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. And this matter of harsh judgment is certainly something that we need to be very careful of. The Lord, I think, makes it very clear that we are not to sit in harsh judgment. But he also said, by their fruits ye shall know them. And sure, we got to determine what's fruit. And the late Dr. James McGinley, he put it in his rather unique fashion. He says, I'm no judge, but I'm a fruit inspector. And we can really tell whether Christian's producing fruit or not. Now, he's putting us now on the horns of a dilemma. He says, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and ran you. Now, you've got to determine who the dogs are, haven't you? This is not a four-legged dog he's talking about. And you have to determine who the pigs are, the swine. And you're not to cast pearls before swine or give that which is holy to dogs. Therefore, there is a judgment that you and I need to make. There are certain places that not be worthwhile to say a word. I remember a friend of mine was in the Tennessee legislature. He was a heavy drinker, and he got marvelously, wonderfully converted. And when I go down to Florida, in fact, when I'm in Boca Raton, Florida, I see him down there. He's a really choice servant of God today, and how he's changed. He's a different man than he was when I knew him as a young fellow. And, of course, I was different then also because he and I ran around together. Practically an alcoholic. His wife left him and home broken up, it looked like. And then he had this marvelous conversion. And he was in the legislature. And the fellows knew how he drank, and they heard he got religion, as they called it. When he came in, one day they all were looking him over. And finally, one got up and addressed the chairman of the meeting and said, I make a motion that we hear a sermon from deacon so-and-so. Everybody laughed. He got up. He was equal to the occasion. He said, I'm sorry I don't have anything to say. He said, my Lord told me not to cast my pearls before swine. And he sat down. They never asked him anymore, and they never ridiculed him anymore. There are certain ones won't do you any good to speak to them. You're wasting your time. Well, he tells us what we're to do. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Now, very candidly, Ask, seek, and knock refers definitely to this. Now, you may be able to use it in other relations, and I'm sure you can, but this is what it has reference to. 
Now you've met a person. How are you to treat that person? Are you to judge them harshly? Or is this a swine or a dog? Now, when I start out from home in the car of a morning, and I always ask the Lord, I tell him I'm going to meet some new people today, and I want him to tell me how I'm to act. There are some people that will need my help, and I can help them, and I want to be able to put my arm around them and help them. But there's some other people that I meet, I better be careful. They'll put a knife in my back. And I've been taken in. Oh, you'd be surprised how many times I've been taken in by those that I ought not to be taken in by. I could tell you many instances. I don't have time today of how I've been taken in. Isn't it interesting that Peter in the early church, he knew Ananias and Sapphira were lying? I can never tell when a fellow's lying. We don't have that spiritual discernment today that they had in the early church. I think it's a gift today. I think some people have it. To tell the truth, I think my wife has it. I have found out that she's warned me about several individuals. She said, be careful there. And others, she said, I think you ought to help so-and-so. And I found out that her judgment's been good, lots better than mine is. Probably a woman has a little better spiritual discernment in these matters. May I say to you, this is important, you see. And we are to go and make it a matter of prayer. When you meet new friends, do you ever ask God to make it clear to you how you're to treat them? Well, I found out it's a good idea to do that. And then he goes on to say that God wants to help you in these matters. What man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone, ask a fish, he give him a servant? And he says, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your father which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him. Now the golden rule comes in right here. Therefore, and that's the most important word here, therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, for this is the law and the prophet. All right, you meet somebody. How are you going to treat them? You don't know. You're not to judge. But the other time, if it's a dog or a swine, you sure better know, because I tell you, the swine will kill you. I've discovered that. You have to watch a lot of phonies today. Well, what do you do? Make it a matter of prayer. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, this is the principle that you should operate on, therefore. But may I say, all of this comes together in one package. Don't lift the golden rule out and say, I live by it. Let's understand what the Lord's talking about. Now he says, enter in at the straight gate. Wide is the gate. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many there be which go in there, because straight is the gate. Narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. Few there be that find it. Now the picture he's given here is not the old picture of a big broad way with a lot of fun on it and a very narrow way. What he's given is a picture really of a funnel. You enter the funnel at the broad way, but it keeps narrowing down until you come to death and destruction, and hell. The other one, you begin at the narrow part, and that's where Christ is. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And you enter there, and he says, I've come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. And the more you walk with him, the wider it gets. Remember in Ezekiel, out from the throne there came a river. There's just a little stream at first. It widened out, and finally it became an ocean. That's what it means to become a child of God. It gets better every day when you're a child of God. That's what he's talking about here. Now he says, beware of false prophets. The church is to beware of false teachers, but they all come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. And that's a good way. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? He says you to know them by their fruits. That's the thing we should watch for in the lives of these. And now he says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You can run around and mouth about living by the Sermon on the Mount, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. How about doing it, my friend? And if you do his will, you'll come to him as Savior and recognize you need a Savior. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, in thy name cast out demons? And in thy name done many wonderful things. Well, you say to me, why, these miracle workers today, you know God's with them. Are you sure of that? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whoso heareth these sayings of mine 
doeth them. I liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. Rain descended, floods came, the winds blew, beat upon that house. If you come to him, he's the foundation. No other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, when you come to him and rest in him, you can build on that foundation. And you can build a life that has fruit in it, not by your own effort, but that which the Holy Spirit produces, that which is gold and precious stones and silver. And then there is the other house, and that house is built on sand. What is that sand? That's human goodness, human effort, the old weakness of the flesh. My friend, may I say to you, you need something better than you have to offer today. And he concludes this by saying, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribe. That's the kind of a teacher he was. He came teaching with authority. He's not just repeating something. And you and I today need to recognize that we haven't anything to say unless we can say it with authority, unless you believe it. I don't want to hear a man giving me a string of theories that he's never tried them at all. He knows nothing about them. Today, we have a gospel to give, a message to give, a message of salvation. And we know it works because it's worked in our case. And we have the witnesses of others, and it's by coming to Christ. Friends, the Sermon on the Mount, it's a glorious passage of Scripture. Don't bypass it. Don't say it's not for today. It is. And if you read it aright, it's going to bring you to the person of Jesus Christ. You're going to come to him, and you're going to say, Lord, you said these things, and I don't measure up to them. And I know you want them done, and I can't do them in my own strength. And I'm guilty before you. I've fallen short, and I need your mercy. I need you as a Savior. And you turn to him. Then he gives you the Holy Spirit that he might produce these things in your life. And so today, all of us are building. Where are you building your house? You're building it on the rock foundation, which is Christ? Sure, you've got to have good works, not to be saved, but to demonstrate to others you need that fruit. Are you building on the foundation? Or are you just building out there on the sand? That won't stand the white light of His presence. Oh, that you and I might be brought to Christ through the sermon on the map. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Yes, the Sermon on the Mount goes much deeper than the simple meaning of stories. In our next broadcast, Dr. McGee gives a lesson just on the Sermon on the Mount. This extra message puts the whole study in perspective, helping us to focus on the real message of Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Now this weekend, why don't you reread these important chapters in Matthew and be ready to receive all that the Lord has for you in the study of His Word on Monday. If your heart is inclined to go even deeper, then discover the many free resources available to you on ttb.org. If you haven't done it yet, begin by reading Dr. McGee's booklet, How to Understand the Bible. And then another great one is our new Bible companion for Matthew. It's a perfect complement to our study, and the discussion questions will really help you focus your thinking on what we're reading in God's Word. These are just two of the many free Bible study resources available at ttb.org. Why don't you take some time to look through them all and see what strikes you. I want to warn you, though, a few minutes can turn into a few hours as God's Word pulls you in and He Himself draws you close. Again, that's ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help you find something specific. And of course, you can always write to Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Now, we got a break for the weekend, but our time together in God's Word doesn't have to stop. So we're celebrating a little Christmas in July, if you will, on the Sunday Sermon Program this weekend. So why don't you join me and Dr. McGee for the message from Luke 2, Glad Tidings of Great Joy. And then, of course, you know we'll be back here on Monday, ready to dive back into Matthew 5. Maybe someone you know would benefit from joining us on Through the Bible. Why don't you invite them? Scoot over in your seat on the Bible bus and make room for just one more. There's always room. 
And if English maybe isn't their first language, that's not a problem. Just introduce them to ttbinmylanguage.com, where you can listen to Through the Bible in more than 100 languages, and we can pray their hearts will be touched by God's love for them. Well, I'm Steve Schwetz. For the whole Through the Bible family, we're praying that you know the peace of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus made it Well, ride the Bible bus for five years and you'll be amazed at what God teaches you from his word about what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's a blessing that keeps on going. That's what we believe at Through the Bible.